So what would you say? Go to the Gospel of John, the very last verse, which we read last time. Why this Gospel was written. John goes on, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Okay, last verse. But these that he did write have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of the whole book of John is key here. Other purposes as well. Good lessons. Because remember, this is not a church age letter or epistle. It's at the end of the Jewish age, was cut short, and then the last seven years of tribulation will finish it. Intercalation means some event is going to happen in between those two items, the end and then the final seven years. So, intercalation means, but there's nothing related to that in the sense of being part of that age, but it's related in other senses, which we, we can just uh, read and corroborate. 2,000 years later, almost there. So we have letters in between to get us through, us, Jew and Gentile who believe. So you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you may have life in his name, and you have eternal life. But now we have a different affiliation called the church, the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles together. But prior to that, which the Gospel of John reflects that particular historical period, is the law of Moses. And Israel as being God's chosen people, but not being very successful at it and not being uh, actually charged to be God's chosen people because they never turned away. They kept turning further and further away and actually worshiping the Mosaic law, their versions of it. And uh, God held them under the Roman Empire rule. But a new generation, just 2,000 years later, will come upon Jesus Christ in his second coming. All will believe of that nation Israel. And God says, okay, I've given you all these years of decades where you were my chosen people, and you have no longer been my chosen people these millennia. So I will just transform all that believe in him, Jesus Christ, in his second coming, transform them into perfect, mortal human beings. Astonishing, right? Perfectly knowledgeable of the Bible. You don't have to study it. You'll know perfectly. Why? Because instantly you have to administer via the word of God, perfect knowledge of it, to the Gentile nations in the world when Christ comes again and begins his millennial rule. And they have to be in mortal bodies. And those Jews, those generation, that generation of Jews, will then have children. And they will have to also decide to believe or not. And surprisingly, with Christ ruling in the millennium, many will not choose to believe. Can you imagine that? Jesus Christ right there at Jerusalem, ruler of the world, King of kings and lords of, Lord of lords, will not choose to believe. Amazing. That's within the nature of man. One more time we prove with Jesus Christ's presence that man needs to be transformed into a perfect being that cannot sin. And we look back at the Garden of Eden and they chose, they could choose, they were perfect, but they could choose to go either way. Now we'll be in re resurrection bodies and we'll choose only those things that will bless us for the rest of eternity. In any case, that's John 20. And 31, I didn't read this before. In John 20, 31, the pastoral plus hoti, believe that, construction also denotes saving faith. All a matter of grammar saying the same thing. While some may argue that this combination denotes an intellectual acquiescence that falls short of effectual faith, grammatical nonsense, it seems obvious that one cannot believe in, into, unless he or she believes that. Think of something that you can believe in. Like, is it morning? You believe that it's morning? I believe in the fact that the clock says it's morning. Have you said the same thing? Yes. Some a little more detail than others. Each implies the other. In fact, if one really believes that, that one can hardly not believe in or into. Into is a little archaic, but you can you, you read the literature, especially archaic literature. We find the hoti, that construction, T-H-A-T, construction, in two passages, they clearly discuss the condition for salvation. John 8, 24 says, If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The other passage is no less than John's purpose statement of John 20 and 31. 
that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. All right, move on, moving on. Then there's some, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what to call these people who think this way, faith in or into a concept, concept or individual does not constitute becoming one with that concept concept or individual spiritually or organically they they say that, that no 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 once you believe into christ you become one with him even part of the deity wow really those those are eastern mysticism religions largely but they want to incorporate their own belief systems into christianity and they make a hybrid religion out of it almost just to fit into a society that's largely christian instead of uh, some other religious country <coughs> of a different religion Furthermore, according to no matter the rules of language, context, and logic by which the Bible was written, and by which it is to be interpreted, okay, there's those are the rules. That's just reviewing how you learn to read when you're in school. Faith in or into a concept or in into an individual, using the Greek preposition ice, in or into, does not constitute becoming one with that individual or concept, spiritually, organically, or some way or anyway. For example, <clears throat> The Greek ice in, into Jesus Christ as one's personal Savior does not then result in that individual becoming one spiritually or organically with Jesus Christ himself as part of the Godhead, such that one may assume any or of the full and in, infinite qualities of God any more than does one who believes in or into a door being the color of green, changes him into the color green himself along with the sprouting of doorknobs and key slots on his person. That's ridiculous. But you translate it back into something normal. Words mean something in English. And they don't change their meaning because of how they're applied. You don't have a new meaning <clears throat> if you're talking from the Bible of the word believe. It's the same old meaning. It's just that what's the content of what you believe? The content if you believe that the best place to go to get something done in your house is Home Depot. Okay, it's not very religious. You believe that. That's my favorite sort. Maybe it isn't. You believe that Jesus died for your sins. The same belief, except the content of the belief is different. And the end result of, of the belief is different. You have eternal life there. Home Depot, maybe you just fix up your house a little bit. Individuals can be spoken of as one with each other when they act in accord with one another or uh, have the same beliefs about specific objects. But you can't try to make this go any further, but this does not signify that they are now wholly joined together organically, spiritually, or mentally. Like you, you, you think you're one with somebody as a friend. Now you have to follow them along and do everything they do. No, no, you just, you're in agreement about something. Maybe in accord, maybe there's a, a feeling of, of uh, purpose with more people directed. I would love to have that in my Christian life, that more people not argue with me over stuff that is not in the Bible, and they claim it is. They listen to my arguments and then prove me wrong where I'm wrong and prove me right where I'm right. Now we're of one accord. The purpose is to get to the truth of the matter, not to win the argument. <clears throat> Six, figures of speech referring to saving faith. There's an important point. People just take these out of context. Bing, Professor, uh, Pastor Bing, Bing. While there is one condition for salvation, he says, John may represent that condition with figures of speech designed to illustrate the response of faith. Remember, look, John 3, 14 to 15, <clears throat> mentions something that came out of the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. The anticipated response is to look upon Christ and his work for eternal salvation as the Israelites looked upon the servant on a pole in the desert for their physical salvation in Numbers 21. They got bitten by snakes and the Israelites in ancient times. Out of a punishment, they turned their back on the Lord. They could be uh, rescued from that, not dying early out of the poison. Moses just made up a bronze snake, put it on a pole right near his tent. All he had to do is look at that pole with a snake on it. Now, well, that was with the intent that you know, because Moses said, if you look on this snake, you won't die of the poison. And people that did that would look upon with the intent purpose of not succumbing to the poisonous snake venom. So the point of illustration is the simple look of faith. <clears throat> Figurative, what's the look of faith? You believe. You look upon Christ and his work, what you learned about him in the Bible, and what people tell you about him that's in the Bible. John 
316, of course, comes to mind. You believe, have a look of faith. Here, similarly, John uses hearing to represent believing, more than the physical senses involved. To hear is to listen, but also to accept is true, as we understand with the colloquial expression, I hear you. Belonging to Jesus as his sheep is conditioned upon hearing his voice of truth by reading it. In your mind, you actually hear it. A lot of times you hear voices in your mind. They're not actual voices with volume, but they're thoughts that that resound in your mentality. Because when you hear somebody tell you something, you, you memorize it, it goes through your mind, and that's the voice. Well, you have the voice of the Word of God. You don't even know if that has a particular character, but the thoughts are there. So in 1016 and 27, as also as obtaining eternal life, John 5, 24, the unbelief of the lost is due to their not hearing God's Word. John 8, 43 and 47. Enter. Speaking metaphorically of himself as the door to the sheepfold, Jesus also pictures the response of faith as entering the door. Let's take a look at it. John 10, 9. Such a great resource. I'll just change the verse here. 10, 9. I am the door, Jesus says. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Figures of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things which he had been, been saying to them. He'll say stuff like that. Now, some people may not get it, but they could ask. And guess what? There are many circumstances in which Jesus explained himself, especially to those who asked him, the disciples, what do you mean by this? And he would sit there, especially uh, when he uh, going back to his retreats, where he, where he stayed, Lake Capernaum, and explain to the disciples what the people in John 6 at the end left him. They were disciples. They followed him. But you're saying stuff that we, we don't want to accept. And Jesus gave more and more, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. What does that mean? That was a figure of speech. Because multiple times before that, in the discussion in John chapter 6, Jesus said, Believe in me, you have eternal life. I'm the bread of life. Moses gave you, uh, in the desert, manna. That's physically you ate. But I'm the bread of life. I'll give you spiritual food, eternal life. Figure of speech. But they didn't want to know, so he didn't explain. Because if they don't, you don't ask Jesus, you don't ask God to come into your life and give you some some uh, enlightenment about my life, eternal life, and living the Christian life, he's not going to give it to you. you got to seek. Feed. Uh-oh, there it goes. The notion of feeding on Christ. John 6.57, we are just talking about that, including eating his flesh and drinking his blood, 6.54, is another analogy of the faith that obtains eternal life, as is clear in 6.35 and 6.47, which came before. Look at 635. He explained this literally. How can you miss this? John 635. And this is in the ongoing conversation, maybe a few seconds later. We don't know what he's talking about. And he, and he says, well, okay. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will not thirst. What's the operative word? Eat? No. Believes. This is eternal life. But they didn't want to, so we don't think that's going to work. We don't want. We're not interested in that. We want to make you in John six. We want to make you be king and kick out the Romans. Well, what about the rest of your life, eternity? In any case. This is similar to the drink of living water, eternal life, we offered to the Samaritan woman in John 4, 10, and 14. Remember that? 4, 4, 10, and 14. To eat and drink is to appropriate or receive something upon which life depends. There is no work or merit associated with these activities. Rather, the benefit is from what is appropriated, which corresponds to the object of faith, which is Christ. It's clear there. And people talk in figurative language all the time. And they'll explain it in their sentence, or it's logically derived that if you have any sense of an education 
in the language that we have, English, I'm, I'm amazed.